Matt DeCourcy is the Parliamentary Secretary for the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Canada. He's also the MP Liberal for Fredericton Oromocto area. Our conversation touched on many things. Specific details, not so much. More we talked about process. In general terms, we tend to think of our elected officials as making decisions on our behalf. But maybe what actually happens is they spend more time working on the process and following the wishes of their electorate. Hope you enjoy the conversation. And is there's a level of education about the democratic process that needs to be elevated within, um, I guess, the knowledge of, of more Canadians. Not enough Canadians understand what our system is comprised of now, let alone what another system might be comprised of. And so for those reasons, um, I'm, I'm comfortable uh, with the decision not to pursue uh, a dramatic change in our, in our f uh, electoral system at this time. Um, I think the stability that we have right now in the world and the standing that we have right now in the world is incredibly important considering some of the geopolitical shifts uh, in the way we view, um, uh, I guess, liberalized trade, the way we view the importance of security around human rights. Um, and, and, and I think Canada's voice in the world right now is important on those matters. And uh, with an issue that can become really divisive when it's politicized, uh, I, think, I think it's important for us to focus on the vision we put forward on economic growth, on inclusive growth, on ensuring that underrepresented groups mm -hmm. are able to achieve socioeconomic participation in all aspects of Canadian society, Indigenous peoples, and we've made significant investments in Indigenous communities across the country. Mm -hmm. And we ha now have two ministries focusing on both the long-term relationship between the Crown and Indigenous peoples, as well as the day-to-day -day service delivery that we know is so vitally important to Indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. Another important aspect that frames both our domestic policy and our uh, foreign policy um, is a focus on women and girls and other underrepresented groups. The evidence is clear that when women are provided equal opportunity to participate in the economy, the economy does better, policy decisions that are made are more beneficial to more people, mm -hmm. and um, the, the Prime Minister, Cabinet, and the entire government have been quite clear that we need to ensure that we get that right to allow greater capacity to see more people have success in Canada. Hmm. And I mean, those are just two historically underrepresented groups. Uh, persons with disabilities need to be provided more capacity hmm. uh, to participate. And that speaks to the way we build and support infrastructure development and public transit. Hmm. Um, our climate change uh, focus is important, again, because we know that women and girls around the world uh, face the greatest threat due to climate change. Um, and if we want to be successful uh, as a country, as a global community, we need to address that. And, uh, and certainly there are challenges in doing that, but, but, but those are the focus areas for us. Thank you. Big strokes. Um, big policy, but that's the level you're working in now. But bringing it, it's got to connect like you do back to your community. Yeah, so, I'd so love to got, talk about the priorities here. Yeah, yeah, you know, because so we could talk about Indigenous and Native communities, the challenges they face. The solution isn't going to be money. Um, it's, you got to have money as a resource, but the money has been the approach for 30, 40 years, and, and there's still this water issues or water issues and such. Mm -hmm. So somewhere in that paradigm shift that needs to occur that I was alluding to earlier, that the systems and methods that we've used for 40, 50 years don't quite get us where we want to go, so something needs to shift. And now you're playing at that level of, of high-level policy and major funding that would support all that. Mm -hmm. Two key pieces, like, you know, that counts. But at some point, it's it's got to hit the road. It's it's got to make a tangible, concrete difference. Mm -hmm. And to date, there's been a gap there somehow, some way. Well, I but would. Do you have any sense of that? I I would I would argue that there are tangible improvements, and uh, in over the last couple of years, 
there have been over 700,000 jobs created in Canada over the last uh, two years. We've seen um, we've seen economic growth at a rate that hadn't been seen um, in approximately 17 years. Uh, the key is to make sure that that growth, uh, that, that people who have not always been a part of that economic opportunity are able to participate. Um, but, but I do see those steps helping. At the same time, we know that in our communities, there are still people who are struggling. Sure. Well, one, the- one of the areas of focus for me uh, in Fredericton and New Brunswick is on um, making sure that we can, uh, as an aging population, uh, provide people with opportunities to care for themselves longer in their homes, to be healthy longer, mm-hmm. uh, and also um, find ways to help provide them the type of community supports they need uh, mm-hmm. when they do need help uh, being cared for. And that's a conversation, healthy aging, that doesn't just start yeah. when you're when you're <laughs> elder on in years. I mean, this yeah, is yeah. a conversation yeah. about about healthy living. Uh, yep. with younger generations as well. So two past guests on the show, Ken McGeorge, who's a, a specialist in this area, yeah. and has much to say, and as well Karen Lake, who was the guest yeah. on last week. Yeah. And so Karen, from her perspective, sees the potential for two to 3,000 decent paying jobs mm-hmm. if we could just create the training mechanism and, and get the provincial government, in this case, I think, to have the lens to understand there's a job opportunity, job creation opportunity here. Right. Keeps people in the home a lot longer for a professional in-home care system. Yeah. And that saves hospital costs. And so I would share the view that there's economic opportunity, job opportunity in the healthy aging yes. sector, yes. and uh, and so, and no better place than New Brunswick, yeah. fastest aging population yes, in the know. country. So, so how do we get there then? How do we turn it into something that it hits the road? Uh, I I can tell you that uh, the provincial government and the federal government are talking now about strategies and opportunities to do that, um, and my focus over the last two years has been making the case to my colleagues in Ottawa and working with the provincial government, the municipalities, and those two people who you mentioned Mm -hmm. as part of community roundtables to identify opportunities that we can go and and push on for for support and resources. Because that gets to the underlying issue, which is change. We're so used to doing it a certain way, right. and we really need to shift to do it another way, so we have to let go of the old way. And Can I talk about a few other things that I see as positive locally that, that I think in the long term will help us uh, face our health care challenges and promote healthy aging? Uh, one of which is is the, the new infrastructure at UNB, the Center for Healthy Aging. Um, that will support research and, and practice-focused research around chronic disease prevention uh, that will focus on um, uh, helping use technology in, uh, in, in helping support people age in a more healthy way and will also you know, prepare people education-wise to move into those fields. So I think that's positive. At the York Care Center here in Fredericton, um, you have the Age Well National Innovation Hub, a center of excellence, which is taking, um, you know, uh, different, uh, again, technologies and, and new applications and trying to model those to help support healthier aging. And, and the federal government, as part of the health care accord, struck with the province in December of 2016 and, 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 and worked on over the last year, has um, has invested 125 million extra dollars over the next 10 years for a home care strategy. Affordable housing will be an important part of this as well, and those mm-hmm. agreements are coming forward that will help uh, seniors uh, stay in affordable housing because you know financial security is as much a part of mm-hmm. being healthy and being well as as physical and mental health. So um, those are those are good starts. Mm-hmm. I think if we keep talking with people like Ken, with Karen, and with others with an expertise who have really good ideas mm. to pilot, mm. New Brunswick's the best place to do it. Yes, yes, we would serve the country well that way as being the, the Petri dish. English, the French, <laughs> Indigenous, newcomer, yeah. urban, rural, close, and, well-connected. You've heard me say this before. Sure, and, and you know, I'll do these commentaries called As I See It, and one of them was about we have such close proximity to each other. We're the third most populated density wise right. in the country so yeah. we have access to each other we know each other we geographically close like we should be flying yeah. 
Um, it sounds a bit like uh, the system or the process almost sounds like a bit like a caterpillar because it's exciting what you map out and but it's like it's going to bunch up here and then stretch out there and then bunch up here and then stretch out there for the mobility, if you know what I mean. So it might be it would help the public to understand that we're at this phase in the process. So look for the outcomes to hit the street, you know, here. Don't expect them to happen in a... Tough in a four-year cycle, isn't it, Dennis? E that's yeah. the next follow-up, yeah. right? Because what, what do we make sacred? Mm -hmm. In the sense that we get to play with it, but we know overall, that was the an original question, yeah. we're going that way. It doesn't right. matter if you're blue or red or purple or green or orange, or it doesn't matter. No, but these things are going to be done this way. We can tinker around the edges, but so the, you know, public health care is one, one of the things Canadians' identity has been on for a long time. Yeah. It's one of those moments where we, we found consensus and it took root and a shift occurred. But that was a while ago now, and some of it needs to be retweaked again. So can we find those moments where consensus arrives and then it hits the action into the community? Because we have to. <laughs> That's the 20-year window we live in. So. Uh, consensus is, <laughs> is, is, is a neat thing um, on its own, trying to achieve consensus on an issue. And, and, and sure, consensus is not necessarily unanimity. Mm. But, I mean, when you get a broad sense that people can find some level of comfort with a direction, yes, uh, then then you can start to move that way. Um, and, and that's been another thing that I've learned is, is when we make policy decisions, sometimes bold policy decisions that may be uncomfortable for people, we should do our best to find some way to give those people some level of comfort with the direction in which we're moving. People understand the healthcare system in the way that it was set up years ago, and yep. that model is changing. Uh, I think we want to move to a more prevention-based system that takes yep. all levels of government and all different <laughs> stakeholders and uh, innovative and entrepreneurial thinking to achieve, and it takes time for people to adapt their thinking and their comfort level to a different approach, especially when they've always been yeah. sure that they could show up at the hospital and receive that service after they were already ill or sick. We want to try and keep people healthy. Yep. Uh, we know that A, it provides better quality of life, and B, it makes economic sense. Yep. Yep. Uh, so, so I think we're on that path, Dennis. Yeah. Uh, my goal will be to keep seeing tangible investments made in our community which as we talked about is well set up to lead in these approaches i mean we've got we've got ourselves a talented civil service we've got the research uh, and educational capacity through our yeah. universities and community colleges um, we've got a burgeoning entrepreneurial scene we were named Canada's startup capital community back in 2016 yeah. umb was named the entrepreneurial community in the country uh, by Startup Canada a few years prior to that were one of the best places to invest in. Uh, we know that we love our quality of life. We're like, you know, yeah. we're like a city in the middle of a park here in this part of the country. Yeah. Uh, we just, we need to keep moving people along in a comfortable way with, uh, with these innovative and new approaches. Thanks for that. Um, because we can dive into some of the the detail, but also talk about the process. Sure. It, it would be fascinating to see one day, <clears throat> um, doesn't matter your political stripe, because it's such a good idea, everyone votes for it. Yeah. Everyone, almost everyone votes for it. Can I, can I give you one uh, <laughs> more localized issue that I see broad consensus on uh, across partisan stripe, uh, across the community, business, uh, all the institutions, the different mun municipalities, and that's a focus on um, increasing the capacity at our airport. Hmm. Uh, the airport is a project that, again, is a priority for, for me to see come to fruition, um, you know, sooner rather than later. We've worked on reducing some of the policy barriers at the federal level, and we've worked collaboratively with our provincial colleagues to identify it as a priority because all these different voices in the community said, we understand how important this is. It, it, it helps ensure that base gauge town which is one of the hugest yes. economic contributors the third largest yep. uh, in the province um, is able to see the flow of the military women and men and families who come here to serve our community yep. it connects 
the universities and UNB alone uh, generates uh, 1.2 billion in economic spinoff, economic uh, you know product to our yep. province, uh, and and that's important. You've got the civil uh, service, you've got people working in business in in high tech, and and the reality is now global fields. They need to be connected to the world, and the world needs to be connected to us. Um, and uh, and and we're the we're the seat of government. Uh, you know, governments need to be connected to us as well. So um, that is a, a localized regional project that I've seen consensus develop over. And and because of that, uh, it's been a focus of mine to to help move that. And and I'll keep moving on it until it's accomplished. Do you remember when there was a chance for New Brunswick to have an international airport, but the three mayors? argued with each other so much in the mid 80s <laughs> that the federal government decided no we we can't help you out did, so are we past that that's my point do you so, think so admittedly i wasn't paying attention to the public <laughs> policy conversation uh then as as much as i am now i think at this point there's a recognition that fredericton is the capital city in new brunswick with everything that's going on needs that capacity here and that has been uh, a value shared uh, and a view shared by all of my predecessors hmm. as, who were members of Parliament, Keith, Andy, Bud, yeah. uh, Bob. I mean, they all they yeah. all supported that uh, project and that institution. Um, one thing that we focused on as an Atlantic region um, through the Atlantic growth strategy is working more together in the areas of infrastructure innovation, green technology and climate change, immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that to support economic growth, there's no better way to do it than through people. Mm -hmm. Bringing people here with their unique skills and abilities and bringing their families with them, yep. uh, people who help them uh, in the settlement process and, and to be well and, and, and secure in themselves. Uh, so those have been focus areas that right from the Prime Minister's office through the Minister of innovation, economic uh, development and science, the immigration minister, the the four now five um, federal ministers from Atlantic Canada and the four premier's offices have been working incredibly hard on uh, to ensure that where there are opportunities to collaborate um, on, on initiatives and on projects that uh, can be more efficient, can be more affordable, but can also provide a quality of level of service that uh, that we do that. So um, understanding that even within Atlantic Canada, there are unique uh, differences within communities and, and areas. Um, we, we know that as a region, we need to work together to ensure that we have a strong voice uh, on the Canadian level. Two other fields to play in a little bit, um, and they're related, climate change and food security. Yeah. One of the conversations... Certainly related, yeah. Yeah, one of the conversations that comes up constantly around this table is that New Brunswick grows, you know, 7 or 8% of its own food. We import, you know, over 90% of our own food. Small population with the land mass we have. Um, there used to be 13 or 1,400 family farms. There's now mm -hmm. three or 400 family farms. Mm -hmm. There's a whole move back to how do we support ourselves, sustain ourselves. Given climate change and what's happening in California and impact on food systems and in southern U.S. and impact on food systems, it would make sense that, you know, Atlantic Canada and that upper right-hand corner of North America where we have water and we have land and we yeah. have trees, you know, yeah. that we should now start planning for 20 years from now on our food security strategies. Uh, does any of that come up in, in your world? It certainly does. Um, we know that traditionally we have relied on our fishery in this region, uh, not only to feed ourselves, but tremendous capacity there to yeah. help feed the rest of the world. Yes. And, and we know that the, um, that the demand for, for protein and, and sea protein what is, is only going to go up uh, in years to come. So investments are being made there. Um, we also know that the, the agri-food sector itself is evolving and innovating, and, and there are ways that we need to build capacity, um, you know, back on the land there as well. And I know our agriculture minister is focused there, and agri-food uh, features prominently in Canada's innovation strategy, ensuring that that we're, um, we're feeding ourselves and, and, and we're in a position to help feed the world too. Um, so at the federal level, those are two 
ways in which uh, we are working on matters of food security and and uh, and long-term stability. I also think through immigration uh, initiatives, we're seeing people coming to our region and uh, and moving into those fields as well. And I think it's important that we foster that. And I also know there are there are organizations like the Ville here in Marysville mm. who are working on agricultural education programs with different populations, some from underrepresented groups, and we should be supporting those initiatives too. Thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.